Welcome to the podcast today. We are going to be discussing uh, the two trade shows that we've just come back from, which is Eurobike and Interbike. No, it's not Eurobike and Interbike. Welcome to the Swifty Podcast, inspiring positive change through design, innovation and technology. Welcome to the podcast. Today we are going to be discussing the two trade shows that we've just come back from. The first one was Eurobike, which is our annual event in Friedrichshafen, and then the IAA, which is the Frankfurt Motor Show. First time exhibiting there. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Yeah, just got back last week. Just got back. First time at an automotive show. Mm -hmm. Um, So as a scooter company, there's sort of not all that infrastructure in exhibiting and you know trade shows retail all that so it's hard to find a home for a little scooter don't you think yeah yeah so we've we've always um exhibited at bike shows and it's not always easy no there's been fierce resistance in the past to anything other than the format of a bicycle so if you were a scooter or if you were a skateboard or any other form factor then you weren't really made that welcome Uh, things are changing which is great and um i guess we've been at eurobike probably uh, for the last seven years i would say so we've done seven shows seven years um and things have really changed and this year was very noticeable uh first of all I think some of the big brands didn't exhibit this year for the first time. Um, and that was interesting. Really? Like bike. Yeah. So I think the show in a whole was a little bit less busy and a little bit smaller oh. as a show. Sometimes they have these um, uh, kind of like expansion halls at the back of halls. And the busiest year I remember, a lot of those halls had an expansion hall at the back. So it could take ex- extra capacity. Um, And the kind of the insight that I learned while I was there was that a lot of the big brands, the big bike brands, they're deciding to put on their own shows and events, um, fly in all of their dealers and uh, they just entertain them at probably one of the big distribution centres. So for the same cost, they can... Probably less. They can basically, yeah, yeah, probably less. Probably less, yeah. They can put on their their own sort of experiential Mm -hmm. thing for all their... Yeah sales guys and reps yeah and i mean that's the big thing isn't it the whole the whole high street is talking yeah, about make a fuss of people experience. and put on all the food and drink and all that yeah we've been to a couple of those yeah. and they're, they're always fun they make you yeah they make you feel special yeah. so big brands tend tend to do that yeah so some of the some of the big brands weren't there this year which um was 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 surprising but the show was also kind of still had that buzz around it and still had loads of cool things to see um yeah, so, I didn't go, so I get to ask. Jason yeah, you came. You came last year, didn't you? Uh, didn't but, go this but time. This time, no. So yeah. uh, it was the first time seeing the final physical sample of Swifty One Carbon. So I was really excited to go because uh, I've only seen parts uh, in the past. So the final assembled sample, pre-production sample, which is great. We've got it here in the warehouse just over there. We've uh, been testing and riding, and it's cool. The, the, it's so lightweight and. Uh, unreal so uh, very excited to see that so I got there so normally we fly to Zurich and then get the ferry across which is lovely so nice to do from uh, Romanshorn over to Friedrichshafen so Friedrichshafen am I saying it right Friedrichshafen Friedrichshafen yeah it's hard to say that one (laughs) Um, so it's a very uh, beautiful uh, little town on it's always uh, perfect weather isn't it yeah kind of yeah it's just the lake is just flat it's it's beautiful so Bodensee Lake is um a really nice place we're going to go on holiday there next year aren't we Mm. and I have some family that live there book your um Swifty holiday oh yeah yeah let's tell everyone about that that's cool (laughs) so you can book a Swifty holiday what is that (laughs) basically you can go to Europe, yeah. You get a Swifty, yeah, and 
you do like a scooter tour around Lake Constance mm. um, or Bodense, which mm. is where your bike is. Yeah. And your luggage gets transported to from hotel to hotel and you just scoot to each destination every day. So every day you're just doing it. Oh. You're laughing at me. <laughs> no, I'm imagining. I'm imagining how nice it would be to do that. Like, and I'm I'm smiling because we 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 should. It's like our our holiday. We should do it. It's like everybody else is doing really it for nice. us. Yeah, the photos um, are amazing. So, so yeah, who's we, the company that some, puts it on? It's called Whereabouts Holidays. Yeah. So Stephen um, so, here locally. Yeah, it's the a, guy that it's a Manchester travel company. They run loads of other. Holidays, cycling, walking, and our scooting holidays. And yeah, um, yeah some amazing customer pictures have come back. It just yeah. looks like, oh, it's so a very, nice. It's a very nice area of the world. The, the water is just like a crystal clear. Yeah. I think it must have and some the, kind of the sediment. The uh, you know, perfect for scooting. Yeah, nice and flat and, yeah. and meandering and yeah. beautiful scenery. And, yep. Ah, oh, cool. Yeah, that's why I was smiling. I wasn't laughing at you. Boat ride. I was, yeah, because I want to. I want to go. I want to go back there with the kids. So, we've got some family in Germany and uh, not far from there, and they've got a motorhome. Sleep six people. Let's do it next time <laughs> before your bike. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, yep, yeah, that's where Eurobike. that's where the location is. Yeah, <laughs> holiday time. It's Friday, right? So. <laughs> And it's been a hard, uh, hard couple of weeks with everything that's going on. So with, with us being at Eurobike mm-hmm. every year, we've seen such a dra- dramatic transformation yeah. in the products being offered. Yeah. Like the innovation in the industry is just mm-hmm. phenom- phenomenal. <laughs> phenomenal. <laughs> Friday afternoons, my brain is so... Keep the mic in front of you. I know, sorry. Phenomenal, yeah. yeah. It is, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. So this... This year is the first year they've got sort of a micro mobility section. And yeah, that whole was, hall. Yeah, whole that was, one. N- you know, music to our ears, wasn't it? Because mm-hmm. um, in the past at Eurobike, um, there have been a lot of scooter brands trying to show there, and they've said no scooters, no, no, no scooters allowed. Yeah, do you remember when we were we were banned from yeah. showing? That was interesting. And we got threatened, like if you turn up, we'll take all your stock away. Off the stand. Yeah, shout out to Eurobike. Yeah. What were you doing? So now they've obviously come to their senses, which is... I think nice. they should give us a free <laughs> booth next year. Um, and um, they have a whole hall for it. A whole hall, so. yeah. All micro-mobility. So in, in that hall this year, uh, there were a lot of scooter brands. And interestingly, there was a lot of tech companies there which are providing the connectivity uh, so we went to go and see, shout out to Co-Module. We've been talking to Co-Module. They do uh, a really cool piece of hardware and provide all the connectivity um, for your scooter. And they also provide the platform whereby uh, the connection takes place. So they're quite a big operator. They're they're quite a young company as well. I think they're only like five or six years old. Um, and then there was so for, so for people who don't know what this connectivity actually is. Yeah, should we just, explain that? Yeah. Okay. What what's that all about? Yeah, it's um re- really it's it's there's a lot of technical jargon that's used, and of course it's t- technically when you deep uh, delve deeper. Sorry, um, it does get technical uh, but really the, the easiest way to think about it is uh, it's 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 just connecting the hardware with the internet of things that's what iot stands for and by doing that it's just connecting it to the cloud so it just means that it can talk to the server and then you can exchange data information requests updates that kind of thing so so it's a to, device that's attached to your scooter yeah that provides a a digital connection yeah. to the cloud. Yeah. And what does what's that for then? So the 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 actual hardware itself is um, a GPS module or a, um, a GPRS module. Um, there's a number of different ways that you can connect. So GPS is one of them. Two G, three G, four G is another way. So you use the mobile phone infrastructure. GPS uses satellites, so it's global satellite positioning. Uh, so they're two different types of connections. Um, most modules have have both, uh, or you can also have a, a radio uh, connection as well to 
um, I think it's called, uh, it's, I can't remember the abbreviation, but it's basically using the radio uh, infrastructure that we have as well. So there's like three different ways uh, that you can connect those devices together. And once they're connected, then you have what's called an API, which is literally like a, imagine it just like a, a I always, I always um, give the example of a travel adapter. So if you've got a, uh, a, a, a UK plug and you need to plug it into European this socket. This is one of your analogies, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I just <laughs> said it's my analogy. Is that confusing? <laughs> no, carry on. No, I'm right. So laughing. listen, you, you, want, <laughs> you want to plug in your phone charger to a European or an American socket and you can't. So you need something in there which will convert your pins your three pins into the two that allow you to charge. That's what an API does. It basically just says that connection needs to go there and that one needs to go there and they can talk to each other and interface. So it's a little bit like an adapter. It just allows you to, um, so for example, with our electric scooter concept that's coming, we want to measure loads of different things and send that data to the cloud. So one of them is the speed, uh, it's the load of the battery, it's the health of the battery, it's the charge cycle. Uh, you want to send all the location data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that information from the scooter needs to go through this device, which then connects it to the cloud, which then on our server, we're able to then kind of reorganize that information and then understand what that information is. So, And then it can be viewed on your smartphone. Yeah, and then you can be, yeah, it can be used for however you like. Yeah, so it basically allows loads of possibilities yeah and there's lots of companies there are lots of companies in at Eurobike who are relatively new companies or they are companies that are now coming into this space of micro mobility um so we met one company for example that do a very interesting very simple gps unit which allows you to track your scooter and they came from um the winter sports industry and their original product was designed to be used for skis and snowboards that you can attach it to your ski or your snowboard and then you know picture it you, you're stopping for lunch top of the mountain you go for a, some nice food and you leave your skis there well your skis can disappear the people can steal them unfortunately and so th this tracking system would track where they go oh was it not for like avalanche no, no, no. It's to track equipment. And so it was a really... So anti-theft. Yeah, like an anti-theft device. And so they've now come into the micro-mobility market and they're looking at using these also for anti-theft, but also their platform allows you to track where the item is and therefore, you know, location tracking or route tracking is totally possible it's easy so we we've actually got one of the modules here we, we we really like what they do we really like their platform and we're we're going to be um we're going to be testing it in the next mm. couple of weeks so so what other things might one use the tracking device for the iot the, for yeah the, the iot basically is just like the plug interface so you can you could do anything with that you could send any number of different um peripherals that you need to measure you need to monitor um you can push data forwards and backwards so it's not just one way so mm -hmm. like firmware updates so let's say uh on our scooter you have something called the controller yeah uh, the controller is what uh tells the battery how much power to give the motor for example uh, it does a lot more than that as well it regulates how much power there is based on our accelerometers that are inside the controller uh, also the tilt sensors so it will know what angle the scooter is if it's going uphill downhill if it's speeding up or slowing down um and so all of that information can be read um and uploaded to the cloud and if we find through that customer journey there is a problem we'll be able to then simulate that problem in our software and then provide a firmware update to, to address that issue so for example let's just say um, we suddenly found some weird fault whereby if someone was going downhill and they were leaning into the corner maybe the scooter would think that the scooter's falling over actually maybe that rider's just riding really aggressively and we've not simulated that in reality so the the customer is pushing the boundaries of what the scooter was intend intent originally intended to be used for and then that could basically cut the power to the scooter because 
the controller thinks that it's actually fallen over. Mm -hmm. So in a situation like that, we could be able to monitor that and understand that that's happened. The customer maybe complains that this happened. Then we could backtrack into what happened and go, oh yeah, he was riding down a hill. We know where the, the location data is. So we know from uh, the topology of that location data that he was going down a hill. Oh yeah, that's where it happened down a hill. Yeah, the controller thought you'd, you'd, you'd fallen over, so it cut the power. So in that situation, we can then make upgrades and figure out whether we can stop it happening in the future. So, so once you've got that connection, you basically can adapt to yeah. whatever yeah. sort of scenario you need yeah. to. It's the, it's the kind of Tesla, Tesla concept of, of always updating and modifying and making things better and better mm. and better and better. And I, and I think that's, that's the future. But this is this is also use, being used already in like these scooter share schemes. Yeah, yeah, use all the, the yeah, IoT yeah. device. Yep. To you know enable you to get the app, unlock the scooter, and then it's tracked. So the new innovation that is using that IoT device mm -hmm. in scooters is the geofencing. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's new. It's been been used for quite a while now. Um, but yeah, this is just another example of um, another example of the functionality that you can provide by just connecting stuff. Yeah, do you want to describe the geofencing then? Yeah. So uh, geofencing works just just by basically because it knows where you physically are, um, where the scooter is. Um, you can you can basically tell the scooter uh, to power down in certain areas, and it's as simple as that. So you can literally draw a line around a specific area in the city, like a central station or something, yeah, or a square or something like. That. Or so you're even not allowed to scoot your electric scooter through the station, yeah. yeah. And the the IoT device tells it to stop powering the scooter. Yeah, I think we need to clear up this kind of mythology of the device and it's like this is a wonderful kind of little box of tricks. IoT is it's literally just like a socket. That's all it is. So it's it's not doing anything special. It's just providing the connectivity. That that's all it is. It's not. So I think it gets it gets misreported like the IoT does this. It's not it's like saying uh, uh, like it's like saying the adapter for your laptop while you're abroad is the thing that sends the email it, it doesn't your laptop does that not the not the iot device so it's literally just a connection that's all it does it provides a connection between yeah. the software which is what you what you put in the controller that's the important bit yeah it's a software sure. so um yeah but it's an enabler isn't it having the device on there yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, it's just a it's just a connection. So I mean. back to geofencing. Yeah, geofencing is um, it's been used by a lot of a lot of scooter providers, and um, and yeah, it's a really good concept. I think it's really smart, really clever, and uh, I think that'll get better and better and better. And uh, originally, uh, I think the first company that I was aware of that did it was the mobile sharing structure here in sharing company structure um a company here in manchester and it was if you went outside of the city limits then you weren't able to physically lock the bike until you came back into where it was allowed to be locked so anyway i think we've 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 talked a lot about this area and we've got we've got, we've got to talk about the rest of the the show we're, we're 23 minutes in already so um, let's talk about the rest of Eurobike. And so there was a new hall, which is great. We've just covered uh, covering micromobility, which is a, a first. And I think that hall will grow in size and I think it will attract more customers. And I think that's what Eurobike needs. It needs this adoption of more form factors. And we saw at the show, or sorry, I should say I saw at the show, uh, not just scooters, but sit on scooters, much larger vehicles, the cargo bike section was huge there was quite a lot of corporate uh, vehicles as well so like um last last mile delivery vehicles in the cargo section so cargo bikes mm -hmm. i mean so these bikes with the big bucket kind of sections at the front there was all shapes and sizes of those and that already is quite a such like electric utility vehicles yeah it's already quite a saturated market i mean I light motorbikes e yeah. vespa style scooters yeah yeah, um, there, there was a there was a lot of stuff there. Stand on scooters as well as loads of bikes, loads of um, 
electric mountain bikes massive, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the bike industry. Yeah, every, so every so I think this is the first year that I've been to Eurobike where I saw pretty much every brand that was there had an EV bike, or pretty much all of E-bike. them. E-bike. E-bike, sorry. And what I did see, which was interesting, was I think the last two or three years, uh, Bosch have dominated the shows with their mid-drive uh, uh, system. So that's an electric motor that sits underneath the bottom bracket of the frame. And uh, that's what that's that's where the power comes from. And uh, I think they've had real issues trying to supply the market in the last couple of years because they're just, they're just so oversubscribed with demand because it's a very good system and it's everyone wants the kudos of Bosch. Um, Do you mean they couldn't supply enough? Yeah, they just couldn't, oh, right. they couldn't supply enough. And um, we've, we heard horror stories of, of major brands being let down. So that's given um, um, the opportunity for some of these new brands to develop their own systems. So some of the, the bigger brands that are out there are... Um, so Panasonic and the likes of uh, are all coming out with their own systems now. And um, yeah, it's really interesting to see so much focus on electric vehicles, electric bikes, and the growth in this market is, is mm-hmm. quite staggering. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if next year or the following year, the balance between non-electric became a minority. I think it this will, it will be... Well, e-bikes are definitely dominating the growth. They're the growth sector in the bike industry, aren't yep. they? Yeah, for By sure. A long way. Yeah, for sure. Just, the growth is immense. And and what's interesting is the price point still remains really high. I mean, some of these electric bikes they're they're four or five thousand euros, which is pretty much one for one with a pound. So, um, four or five thousand pounds for for an e-bike is a big big purchase. And the people I was speaking to there at the show. Um, it's not uncommon to spend that amount mm-hmm. in Germany on a on a on an e-bike, and I think I might be wrong in this, but I'm pretty sure that there's some figure out there that says that Germany bought something like a million a million e-bikes last year or something like that. Do you remember that figure? It's something like it's that, isn't it? It's a lot anyway. So don't quote me on that. So sorry if that's wrong. Have you ridden an e-bike? Yeah, I I tried a few e-bikes <laughs> while I was while I was there. So. Thoughts? Say again? Thoughts? Yeah, they're great. I think they're brilliant. I think um, now, several years in, after riding the first e-bike, I think um, it's become normal. It's become normalized, Mm. like an electric version. And at first it felt very, you know, very special and different and a little bit like... uh, In the industry at Eurobike, there was a a lot of fierce rejection from the bike brands. They were like, this is taking over. And the retailers as well. And the retailers. didn't believe in them. Yeah, but actually, once you try one, you realise that you just feel so superhuman, don't you? And you can, yeah, yeah, it's your, cool. Your range to, yeah. you know, your energy levels, yeah, it's yeah. just like multiplied, yeah, by having a small motor and small battery. I it's think, still pedal assist, isn't I it? Think, so you're still, yeah, doing and, exercise. Yeah, and I think the difference is is when, when, when you run out of power. And your battery runs out, then the experience is severely affected. Oh, I see. So that's the trade-off. It's like an the e-bike. Range anxiety. The, the, yeah, the range anxiety. <laughs> and I guess that's one thing that you don't get with a human-powered bike. I mean, how weird is that? You have to you have to dis- differentiate by saying it's human-powered. You can't say it's Pedal. a bike. Everyone just takes it for granted. You can say pedal powered. Pedal powered. Okay, so that's that's the trade-off with a pedal a pedal powered bike. Is that you're never going to run out of steam, never run out of energy. It's like it's always going to be there for you. And pushing around a, you know, a, a, a 20 kilo bike is a real effort. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? They're not as versatile. Yeah. So there's no way you can just like yeah. lift it up and go up a flight of steps. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Easily. Yeah, and you got you got to lock it too up. Too heavy for a lot of people. And you got to lock it up outside. Can you imagine locking up a four thousand pound bike here in Manchester? You wouldn't, would you? So it, it's not it's not the end of the the traditional bicycle by any means. And it's it's um, allowed people who aren't cyclists to try try cycling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it yeah. reaches those um, 
an extended sort of demographic of people. Yep. Doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. It gives them mobility. It Especially gives them an option. Especially the sort of over 50 bracket. Is that yeah, true? And I, well, I think so. And I think people that maybe are have been intimidated by uh, a traditional bicycle, you know, and, and feeling like, you know, having a bit of technology in there feels like it's something they can understand. I mean, we're, we're, we are surrounded by technology 24 seven. And so I guess feeling like it's got a bit of tech in there and it you operate it through your phone and you know you, you can see the power settings and the speed settings through the app it's kind of like it feels like it's uh, people can understand it better and, really? and feel yeah i think so i think i think there is that kind of tech element that it's people, more exciting yeah they gravitate to it feels like it's more suited to them because let's be honest like the cycling industry like the purest cycling industry it, it is a special club of people that if you're not if you don't fit the mold you know well, you, you can't you can't be in the are. club and you you don't feel like you can ride in the uk that's the case i think i think it's like that all around the world i don't, I don't think it's just in the uk well, it's not because hmm. look at holland or copenhagen or somewhere hmm. Loads of European cities, cycling so normal. Yeah, okay. It's the UK. The trouble is there's no space for cycling. So only the brave, sporty types feel comfortable on the road often. And yeah. it's become this sort of... That's why it's become so tribalised. It's not reaching a broader, a broader demographic. demographic. So you're yeah. saying e-bikes enables a broader demographic to... Um, I don't know. I think you're oh, right. It to must do. It must do. Yeah. Anyway, so there's loads of e-bikes at Eurobike, and it's really, really cool to see it grow. I think it's good. I think um, the level of quality, the level of design, the level of engineering is just going up and up and up. And you know, it's it's becoming uh, close to you know the automotive industry. It's everything is everything everything is encapsulated. Everything is seamless. Everything is fits together nicely. Uh, the battery formats are now getting much better to integrate into frames. And, uh, and the, frame designs are so yeah, they're really it's really company. it's great. It's really cool. I mean. I think some of the actual production vehicles that are out there now, you know, you you could you could you could you could go back just five five years and you could put them in a sci-fi movie and it'd feel at home. <laughs> you know, you like honestly, like I think they look really futuristic. Like just the tube design, like what you can do now with hydroforming and all the different processes, the price points come down of that type of manufacturing process and the shapes of the tubes that you can make yeah, and make up the frames. Biking. Yeah, because the demand's here now. So mm. the, the, the manufacturers are figuring out ways of how to do it. So I think it's cool. I think it's great. I think it's very positive. And I think Eurobike is still going to be here for a long time. And I think it has to uh, evolve and move with the changing needs and wants and um, requirements of the industry and the consumers that are out there. And um, if they do that, which they seem to be doing, then then, it, then the show will be great. I mean, it'll, it won't die like Interbike died in America, like the American oh, show. Happened? Well, I think they just, I don't, I don't really know what happened. I was very surprised how that show just ended. Um, so it used to be in Las Vegas and then it moved to Reno. And after Reno, they just can cancelled the whole show. So America is a, a very strange market in terms of trade shows. They they don't really seem to have, um, um, yeah, like a, a dominant bike show like yeah, Eurobike. Like Eurobike. So Eurobike, just to summarise, Eurobike. It was uh, we exhibited on the trade stand. We met new customers and old. Uh, some really nice new opportunities. Uh, the carbon fibre scooter was well received and uh, demonstrated um, then after Eurobike what happened was our amazing suppliers from Taiwan came to the UK and we had a great four days unfortunately you had to go off to yeah they uh, spent four days at Swifty World at Swifty World <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> That's an inside joke. You got to explain that, Sorry. otherwise these guys well, won't know. It was in the last podcast, I think. Oh right. So if you're listening, yeah. you uh, you should know what Camilla's little joke was all about. <laughs> so yeah, you had to go off to Frankfurt Motor Show, 
and I took our wonderful partners around Manchester and went to some very nice restaurants and we went to we drove go-karts we went to <laughs> some local uh, galleries and we did loads of cool stuff so it was a nice four days and it was great to see them come come here and finally rule out fish and chips as our national cuisine well the Taiwanese weren't interested in fish and chips no neither am I I don't like fish and chips I love fish and chips mushy peas rubbish no 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 tartar sauce tartar sauce ketchup mate shall we go on then to yes let's talk about Frankfurt Motor Show and why we exhibited at a car show yeah which is a strange one as we were describing at the beginning scooters don't really have a show of their own and we've witnessed um several automotive brands um bring out their own scooters Mm -hmm. um and it's because they're interested in last mile inner city travel because as cars are getting pushed out of inner cities yeah it's a huge huge growth market Huge growth market. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we had the opportunity to go to the IAA with the Department for International Trade. And we were on the British Pavilion in yep. the Future of Mobility Hall. Yep. Um, which was really awesome. Hmm. Um, what an amazing opportunity. So apart from being next to all these these nine other really cool companies yeah who are all doing amazing things yeah you should shout out to some of the guys we we met there yeah um shout out to new friends at oxbotica mm. who are behind a lot of the autonomous vehicles we're going to get them on the show aren't we yeah we're talk to them amazing they showed us this really cool video of one of their vehicles driving through a it was like a like a like a mine situation so like a you know when you've um, moved all the loads of earth and you've got like a what would you call it yeah like a like a mine a mining operation so it's all like red earth or and it's all banked up really high so it's got no um physical kind of uh features that are like stand out it's not like a lamp there's post not a road there network. no it's just all loads it's of earth just track. it's just earth and track and they showed this video and at first i didn't quite get it and then they they pointed it out and they said look at the vehicle doing the same lap again and again and it's going around this track on its own using something called lidar which is like basically a load of lasers that fire off and get reflected and so it knows where it is and this car literally drove along the entire thing again and again exactly in the same tracks that it just drove in so it looked like mm. it was going on a scale it electric looked track looked unreal. it didn't look real did it yeah. and i was like oh wow that's incredible so if and it, they can do that with any vehicle yeah isn't that what they said yeah so they the process they said was that they they have to go out and map the area first with like their system and then it can, because it knows what it, it knows. Can repeat them, it. Then they can repeat it. So it was really cool to meet those guys. And yeah, we're going to get them on here and talk to them, and try and get mm. them to explain to us how how it kind of works in a in a simple mm. layman's kind of easy to understand way. It's so cool. It's really yeah. cool. So yeah, we met those guys. Who else did we? Um, meet? Oh, we also met Appy Way. Oh yeah, Appy Way. Formerly yeah. Appy Parking. Mm-hmm. Who. Um, are working on technology to map the curbside parking yeah. and sort of pavement space in inner city. So it's yeah. this like section of real estate, I guess, that they're mm-hmm. mapping mm-hmm. and allowing you to find out different parking options in the town. Yep. So they're doing amazingly well. It's really interesting to hear, you know, what they're working on. So shout out to those guys. Also, I went out for dinner with them and we went on the uh, lime e-scooters oh, yeah, yeah. to the restaurant which was really funny <laughs> so um yeah had a had a fun time also you uh we met as well the uh 
a London taxi company. Mm-hmm. What's their full name? LEVC. LEVC. What does that stand for? Do you know? London Electric, Electric. Vehicle Company. Okay, cool. Yeah, and they've got this new uh, London taxi that they were showing, which was kind of like a hybrid electric and um, ice uh, vehicle. So internal combustion yeah, engine. Hybrid. So hybrid, which was cool. It was really nice to hear their story and the investment they've had, yeah, their new factory. Those old black cabs, they need to go, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty outdated and stinky. Stinky. Causing so loads ele- of... So electric hybrid yeah. is coming. Well, they're already out there, aren't they? Yeah, I think they're already out. They're already so there. It's a gradual th- process. And then we we should shout out the par- the Department for International Trade because they have been a huge supporter of Swifty. And um, it's always an absolute pleasure to work with them because they really go out of their way to help us so if you're watching thanks guys i really appreciate it it's um really humbling for us to get such a level of support from you guys um and uh you know we're such a a tiny company in perspective to some of the other companies we always go along so uh go along and exhibit with so um yeah thanks very much really it means a lot to us and it, it, it has has already brought some really great opportunities, is not it? Mm-hmm. So we met loads of cool people. So you you were out there for the first four days. It's a really long show, wasn't it? It was Tuesday to Sunday. Yeah. And so then I uh, joined Camilla on the Thursday, and we had one night together, didn't we? Twenty four hours. Twenty four hours. We got an Airbnb in the north of the city, which was really nice. Um, really nice location. And, um, yeah, then you went, you flew back home on the Friday and then I did the show for the remaining, um, time I was there. Oh, do you want to talk about the, um, what? the, uh, racing car guy? Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's <laughs> really cool. So there was a, like a formula car just next to our stand and I've yeah. been looking at it all week. Yeah. It's like, hang on a minute. Yeah. There's no cockpit. Yeah. No How driver. does that work? Yeah, so it's an autonomous uh, F1 style car, and uh, from a company called Robot Race, and we met the guys. Robo Race. Robo Race. Sorry, Robo Race, and um, yeah, it looks really cool. They just drove that vehicle, or the, sorry, they didn't drive it. They let that car drive itself at the Goodwood Festival mm-hmm. speed, and we saw the video, and it looks so cool. I've also seen on their their YouTube channel that they map the tracks on a scooter, but not one of our scooters. Something really? else. Yeah. What sort of scooter? It's an electric scooter with a little saddle and <laughs> oh, right. they have to go and map the track. No way. Yeah. So they do it on a scooter. So I think we're going to get them one of the new Carbon Swifty ones. Mm-hmm. And if they're in agreement, they should totally go around on a carbon swifty one yeah. we'll make them a, a special one just for them because it's so cool so yeah it was really interesting to see uh what they're doing they were on the microsoft stand weren't they next to us and oh yeah that's yeah, right yeah they were they were they were showing there but in general mm-hmm. a general overview of the show yeah there's just so many fancy cars that it's unreal yeah all so all shiny the, yeah but in every hall, there was some sort of autonomous shuttle. This is like such a massive thing in automotive. Mm. And they're all, all developing the technologies behind and also the hardware yeah. for autonomous shuttles. You so should explain what you what you mean by autonomous shuttle because when you when we when we spoke on the phone while I was still here in the UK, yeah. I was like, What do you mean autonomous? It's like another word like micromobility that It's been put together and nobody really, well, sorry, not nobody, but people that haven't seen those vehicles don't know what the context is. It's like, what do you mean autonomous shuttle? So explain what it, what it is and where it's going to be used. Self-driving taxi, sort of. Okay. Isn't Mm -hmm. it? Yep. So often they seat about four people, four or six people. They don't have a driver, but they... They can pick you up from wherever yep. using a smartphone or something and they drive along the road so like, themselves. So like, um, <laughs> for example, it'd be like getting from the airport to your hotel or something. Yeah. Like something like that. Yeah. So 
I, I think the, everyone realizes that having autonomous shuttles in the public domain, just like going around anywhere without drivers, is really far ahead in the future. It's like yeah. 20 years away. Yeah, so specific but where, locations. Where they will get adopted is it in private locations, like yeah. going around airports. I think that is will happen really soon well like a big can, uh, like a big um factory site yeah i remember going um where you can just click oh, i want to be picked up yeah then you can see where the next shuttle's coming past just mm-hmm. jump in mm-hmm. and it'll take you to wherever you want to go so it's not yeah yeah it's cool isn't it so there was a lot of those there and yeah you're right but every- everybody was doing the same thing that's mm. what was quite surprising that there was not much sort of differentiation between the different brands yeah everyone's like this is the future autonomous shuttles this is our version of it yeah it's all the same no autonomy electric i mean electric was smart cities electric electric was massive it's the i think um i mean i've never really been to a big motor show like that before but um i think it was really interesting to see that yeah, you've got the Nissan Leaf and then you've got the Tesla and that's basically about it. You've got like the BMW i range, which you don't really see many of on the road. I mean, you see loads of Teslas and you see loads of the Nissans and there's a couple of us that are out there, players, but at the show, every every single brand every had brand. a concept from Ford all the way up to, you know, Porsche. Porsche showed their new 911 electric and it was like, whoa, okay. It's, you it's had to co- go on a Jaguar. I-Pace. Yeah, Jaguar I Pace. Yeah, I drove one of those. I did. Um, I did uh, Jaguar parkour. <laughs> <laughs> what they actually called it? Parkour. That's what, that's what they oh, called right. it, and I got really excited. And it was like just a tiny, a it's tiny not like jumping up buildings. It was a tiny car park with like some <laughs> bollards that flashed green and red, and you basically had to go from one bollard <laughs> to the next. I was so disappointed. Uh, I was you were really... thinking actual parkour. Well, or was that well, car called the... parkour? No, no, no. It was oh, called right. Jaguar parkour. <laughs> and it was so rubbish. But it was really cool to get uh, in uh, a, a car like that. And and actually, I, I think um, being like r- driving a car like that, which I mean, I could, you can't put your foot down. It was like a hundred square meters or something. It was nothing. And I had a guy next to me all the time yeah, from Jaguar. Square of so you couldn't track. really go fast at all, but I could feel the power mm-hmm. when I did push a little bit. And it was like, you could feel that there was a lot of power there ready to go. And the car just moves. I mean, it just moves like at a relatively low speed. The acceleration was just incredible and he told me all the stats i don't know what the stats are i can't i couldn't be able to repeat you but i remember at the time thinking oh my lord that is so powerful and so Mm -hmm. the one thing that i think is terrifying being a parent as well is that when i was queuing up ready to go on there was no sound at all and this like probably ton and a half beast of a machine that travels very fast very quick I mean, you only have to slip your foot and you're going to be... Woof. Don't they put little noises in there? No, there's no noise. There's no you've noise. you've had the Gogoro e-scooter, haven't you? That has loads of little beeps and stuff. It's so cool. Huh? No, I've not, not seen heard that. it. I've driven the Gogoro. I've not heard oh. the beeps. Are you sure? Saw a YouTube video. Okay. Well, I think there's an opportunity. And you can choose your own little tune. Right. And, like whizzy noises. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So currently that doesn't have a solution, that vehicle. Uh, they don't They don't have any sound. There's no sound. Even the lady that was doing the introduction was like, yeah, we've got a bit of a problem with the sound. We're working on it. So I think they'd been kind of briefed on how to reply to someone like me who's, you know, customer coming up to try it, how to answer. And they said they're working on it and they're waiting. So they're f- going to insert some sounds. That they're waiting for legislation <laughs> to change, to for the legislation oh, really? to to say because they think that legislation will lead the way i was like well you should be leading the way you should be showing how it how it could sound really cool i mean do you remember watching that video that time when we heard um we watched uh was it the bugatti veyron and there was a like a famous conductor and he was working on the exhaust system of tuning the exhaust system to make it sound amazing like the vroom 
Hmm. I am doing a bad job of it, but and do you remember watching <laughs> that program? We watched it together. I don't remember. Yeah, it was really cool. It was showing you how they really go very specific on trying to tune the sound to make it look to make it sound amazing. Yeah, I think the Gogoro have done it. I have oh, to find right. a okay. little okay. clip of it's it, and you can choose your own little tune as it's, well. It's totally something we need to do to need to do for yeah. for our new Swifty. We need to make it sound great. So if anyone's got any good ideas, let us know. I'd quite like to use a mechanical sound. So like... Like from... The, no, the, <laughs> no, the sound of the air passing over something can make a sound. So, uh, you know, like a fan turning has, okay. a, has, a, has a sound to it. So that's a mechanical sound as opposed to putting a speaker like and then playing a bit of a... Bird tweets. <laughs> What kind of world do you live in? <laughs> Scooting along, <laughs> listening to the birds, tweeting. I like listening what to the birds. What a wonderful world. <laughs> Bird songs, whales. No. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so I drove an iPace. That was really cool. And uh, yeah, the, every single automotive maker had an electric concept, which was super interesting. Um so we met some really interesting people on the stand, didn't we? Um, made some great connections. Yeah. Oh, what about the Airbus thing? Yeah, Airbus, Vodafone. So, yeah, I went to look on the Vodafone stand. Mm, yeah, that was really interesting. Do you want me to explain it? Yeah. So Airbus had teamed up with Vodafone and Vodafone have got this site in Germany, which is, um, they said it's the first, I don't know whether it is, but it's like a, a full on 5G network. So they've got these... 5g repeaters around which give true 5g connectivity and they've got this airship the airbus airship which is connected also by 5g and uh, they've got this incredible camera on there which is something like an 8 8k or even higher camera and they're able to um, fly around the local area and map that area relatively quickly a couple of hours um, and what happens is uh they can capture all of the data through very high resolution photos and then they can then map all of that information into a 3d model and it's really super high res like you can zoom right in and see like you'd be able to see the screen on this recorder mm. so they showed us how they'd show it how it works in the, the yeah. um, helium zeppelin yeah and filmed or the area this village basically yeah and they were able to zoom in kind yeah. of move around the in, trees in real time in real time yeah so we could sit there with a little uh like a playstation and i asked type him controller. where are all the people what do you do about identity oh, yeah. and stuff he's yeah. like oh no it's fine there's an algorithm that basically wipes people out if they're moving <laughs> just scrubs you scrubs you out the photo yeah, that's, so a good, that's a good thing though, right? Yeah, so any it's moving not, vehicles, not people. Yeah. Yeah, so trees uh, look really strange because the tree's leaves are moving and so it can't mm. quite decipher what it is. So, And I think in this one um, image of the the small town or village, they'd caught four people who were staying so still that the algorithm didn't catch them. Oh, yeah. Who stands like still for like an hour? Someone having a cup of coffee, yeah. reading a paper or something. Maybe they were asleep. So they had to go snoozing. in manually and scrub them. Scrub him. <laughs> you know what? That's going to be someone's job one day to go in and like. What do you mean one day? They do that on Google. Yeah, Google Maps. All right, yeah, I guess they do. Okay. Hmm. Anyway, so yeah, that was really interesting to speak to them and see what they're doing. And uh, we had a pretty cool discussion. So there's a possible project that we could do with them. Um, using 5G and uh, we'll we'll talk more if that comes off and happens uh, when we're allowed to um, so yeah <laughs> all cool so that was really cool that was interesting what else did we do at the show that we should mention um, should we talk about a couple of other scooters that were there yeah okay go uh well, Mercedes had a had a scooter. Yeah. Didn't they? They had an a micro. E-scooter. Was it a micro? micro yeah, scooter. they collaborated with micro. It was, a, it was electric. On it. Yeah. Yeah, electric Little micro electric scooter. Micro. Yeah. But um yeah. 
felt like just a bit of an add-on. I don't think it really matched Mercedes, did it? Uh, no, not really. I mean... The Mercedes stand was incredible. Like, Yeah. It's out like of, a night, all, like out a of all the brands at the IAA, Mercedes was the biggest. Yeah. It was just... Yeah. Yeah, enormous to start with. Everything was really, really fancy. Yeah. Loads of technology. The, the screens were amazing. Like those screens that they had, which were huge. They're the biggest screens I've ever seen. And they were, they was, they were like 4K screens. Like I've never seen a screen that big in my life. And it is really weird to see, you know, video footage of the vehicle that's like twice the size of like, human life if you see what i mean so it's way bigger in scale but really crystal clear in like, there's no pixelation mm. it was like it's just a, an amazing image of this vehicle and it made you feel like you were tiny you I mean, feel like you've been shrunk so screens are getting so good now that you can't see the pixelation in the mm. screen and it's really surreal you know like you go to the cinema or you know you, you, there's, it's got that film grade to it so it's like a little bit what would you call it fuzzy and but now with screens becoming so high res and so detailed it's almost lifelike it's strange very strange so yeah it was uh it was great to see um a proper automotive show and it was really nice for us to be there and swifty one carbon got well received i think people were pretty excited yeah. by it they loved the hydraulic disc brakes and the people foldability like lifting it and going wow because <laughs> the there are so many e-scooters in Frankfurt that yeah. are really heavy. All the shared ones are yeah. about 30, 40 kilos. Yep. And our carbon's six yep. kilos. Yep. So everyone's like, oh, can I lift it? Can yep. I see how light it is? Yep. And uh, yeah, they were impressed. Yeah. I think we should try and try and wrap this up a little bit. So should we um, just talk about a little bit about the Cedars campaign? Yeah. So Cedar's campaign went live yesterday uh, and whoops, by the time this podcast goes out, it'll have been live for some more days because we don't put them live the very same day. Uh, the link is in the bio. Please um, check it out and support us. It'll be running for 60 days. That's why this last three weeks has been super busy for us because it's been a long time in the making, hasn't it? Um, getting that that, that campaign ready we're already over 50 percent funded mm -hmm. which is really exciting and uh, we'd love you to join us on our on our journey yeah and just an overview of the campaign it's yep it starts talking about how this light electric vehicles and and the kick scooters as well mm -hmm. um are replacing the short distance car journeys that's right and it's sort of um, people might wonder why we went to a car show with this sort of, you know, Concept. message. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's exactly what the automotive industry is looking at. Yeah, they're totally and looking at it. Yep. Everyone knows that big cars aren't suitable for short distance travel. That's right. The car's not going to die, though, is it? People still need to travel further. But in yeah. inner cities specifically, yeah. yeah. Where it's just too congested and there's too the density of the population is really high and it's gonna yep. become higher. You know, cars are not gonna be suitable at all. Yeah, we need more options for the different form factors for different uses. So scooters is part of the solution. Of course. That we have. It's not and the only solution, but it's part of the solution. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many different light modes that are addressing this issue yep. aren't there yeah scooters is just one of them yep. and actually um at the end of the show there was an enormous protest outside because all the um extinction rebellion people were yeah there were a lot of people there weren't there yeah so much so protesting that I, against I the left industry. a bit early yeah yeah oh you left a bit early because of the protests yeah i left early because of that because uh, I would have missed my flight and not come home. Right. Which uh, I didn't want to do. So, yeah. yeah. So there is a lot of things happening within the industry. Mm -hmm. It's not as fast as you'd hope. But, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, step by step, it's getting better. And I think the industry is trying. And, and it does take 
a long time to change people's behaviours because people are stuck in habits, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's one of the challenges. It's not just the industry. Yeah. Right, should we wrap this up? Yeah. I think we should. See you next time, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Bye. Take care. See you soon. Bye.